pretty wild. And I'm looking at your stats, 88 million wallets created, $1 trillion transacted, one third of Bitcoin network transactions. I, I um, can't even see your laser eyes through the camera. So I guess you're not. I've never, I've never posted a laser eyes photo. I thought it was like a, a super powerful sort of game changing innovation. And you created an explorer, right? Which was basically this mind blowing innovation because nobody could see what was happening on the blockchain. We have to learn to be less greedy. There's the real answer. There are only two exchange CEOs in crypto who have had their job for over a decade. Everybody knows Brian Armstrong at Coinbase. The other one is today's guest, Peter Smith from blockchain.com. Peter started at the very beginning building products like a blockchain explorer so that people could actually see transactions to a wallet and then to a full service exchange, institutional, prime brokerage, and more. We talked about that long, long journey, what it was like to be in Bitcoin from the very beginning, to go through all of the cycles of the havings, of the FUD, of the negativity, and what we can look forward to in the future. This is an amazing conversation with Peter Smith. That's dope. You've been in the blockchain space and in Bitcoin since really the very, very, very beginning, right? I mean, blockchain.com was formed in 2011 when most people had never even heard the words blockchain and Bitcoin. Can you give me sort of your genesis story? How did you get started? Um, I like to joke that I've been uh, working on Bitcoin since before it was really a job. You know, the industry was not really an industry probably until 2013, 14, maybe 15 even. It's just like a lot of people that were really interested in the idea. This is a very kind of different and special period of time. I got really interested in Bitcoin and the principles behind it from living in a lot of emerging market countries. So I've lived in the Middle East and East Africa. So this idea of there being an internet money that was beyond the control of a central bank policy, but also that you could transact peer to peer, I thought was like a, a super powerful sort of game changing innovation. And I wanted to be part of working on that. Um, I met the other folks at, you know, my other co-founders of blockchain.com, you know, we started professionalizing the company, really building it sort of in 2013. I originally thought that I would work on, you know, work on this stuff for a couple of years, uh, and then something else would grab my interest. But the thing that's really cool about crypto is that it constantly changes. You know, you are never bored, you know, but now I've been doing it for over a decade. Then I would say that I feel like I know less today <laughs> than I do when I started um, because there's so much more to know now, you know, and I've, I've been privileged to invest in a lot of the more successful projects, you know, help run one here. Uh, and that's kind yeah. of exciting in a way. That makes sense. I guess when you started, it was a very specific thing with a wide open world of needs, but it was just this one thing, right? It was Bitcoin and that's all there was. And you created an explorer right? Which was basically this mind blowing innovation because nobody could see what was happening on the blockchain. How did you come up with that? Why was that the first thing you decided to work on or was it? Did I, I might've missed a part of the story. Yeah. So actually the, the idea for the block explorer was my co-founder, Ben, um, you know, he had this idea that it would be a lot easier to look up transactions and sort of a search product than, you know, downloading the whole text file from Bitcoin QT. And that if people could see Bitcoin happening, it would be more real. Um, and I think that is definitely true. Like even to this day, people want to see transactions happening. They want to see what's going on on the network. It's kind of one of the first things you need when you launch a new protocol is a block explorer to show people actually that it's real and that things are happening. Um, and so that was his innovation, his idea. Um, you know, and it's still one of the most popular websites in crypto today, 12 years later. Pretty wild. And I'm looking at your stats, 88 million wallets created, $1 trillion transacted, one third of Bitcoin network transactions, 37 million verified users, 200 country. It's insane. It's insane. And it's actually kind of, those stats, stats are kind of old now. There's actually now 42 <laughs> million verified users. You know, I think there's like 90 million registrations. We're very sort of honored that so many people have chosen to do crypto with us. So listen, I think we all have a at least superficial understanding of the past. So let's talk about what's happening now in the present and what it means for the future. Obviously, it's been a somewhat huge year 
for crypto, specifically for Bitcoin with the proliferation of institutional adoption, the ETF, all the fun buzzwords and topics that we get to talk about on a daily basis. But did you ever think back then, I guess, that we would see this level of adoption and how meaningful do you think this is? Actually, should it should we be excited about it? Some think we should actually view it as a red flag. Basically, what's your overwhelming feeling on sort of this institutional wave that's coming in? Um, I remember 10 years ago when the first ETF talk started. <laughs> so it's a long road to the ETF for me. We haven't actually seen institutional adoption yet, which is going to be kind of a non-consensus view. You know, I've talked to a lot of the folks working on the ETFs. Most of the buyers of the you know, the new buyers, so let's not grayscale, but the new guys are actually retail investors. So they're not seeing like giant, like, you know, XYZ asset manager buying a hundred mil block of Bitcoin yet. They're seeing a lot of retail orders for that product. You know, basically people putting them in their retirement accounts and, you know, Roth IRAs and all that, you know, donor advised accounts, all that kind of stuff. Much older demographic than is sort of our demographic. We have a tendency to have very young customers, but we haven't actually even seen that institutional wave yet. We are seeing institutional products, which is different than adoption. I think that's really important because it's going to lead to institutional adoption in the future. I didn't feel like all of this was inevitable when I started working on crypto. I thought that the most likely scenario was that it died, but that it would be like a good worthy attempt. My confidence in crypto really built after the first crash and comeback. It was like, okay, if we can survive that, we can keep surviving that. And indeed, like it's still been, you know, boom and bust, boom and bust. But if you kind of draw a line through that and average it out, it's just straight up into the right. And I expect that to continue. I expect there to continue to be big cycles, massive corrections. And it's worth having the perspective that, you know, the whole crypto market today is still very small, you know, like a couple trillion market cap, but most of that market cap is like um, uncirculating FDV, right? So I prefer the circulating market cap of crypto, which is much, much, much lower. Um, and so it's still really small today. Like when you think about it in the sort of perspective of global finance or, you know, even the size of the gold market cap or a single tech stock, it's pretty small today. And it's got a long way to go. And so, you know, I think there's probably another 10 years before we get to sort of a financial ecosystem at scale and sort of the full vision that a lot of us saw and the potential that we saw 10 years ago is fully realized. Like, I think this is a 20 year journey, um, another 10 years. If there's 10 years left, what are we lacking right now that we need to reach that scale? Because, uh, you know, we're only halfway there. Obviously, that means that either we haven't marketed ourselves particularly well uh, to bring everyone in. Uh, maybe their infrastructure doesn't exist yet that we would need to operate at that scale. What are the things that you think we need to build or see in the next 10 years to reach that point? One, we've nowhere near the level of ubiquity. Ubiquity is like, you know, not everyone uses WhatsApp as their primary messaging app, but it's very rare to run across someone who doesn't have WhatsApp installed. If you go out and you're in like normal social circles, you know, not Bitcoiners or crypto people, and you're like, hey, let me send you a stable coin to pay you back. Most people don't even have an app or know how the stable coin works. Ubiquity is driven by how easy it is to use and consumer trust. And that kind of brings me to marketing. I do think that the industry has historically had a marketing problem because in many ways we're most famous for our disasters. You know, the average person is more likely to have heard of Sam Bingman Freed than Brian Armstrong. Sure. Right. That's a problem. <laughs> like the history of crypto is kind of defined by our gigantic blowups, which are mostly fueled by greed. And so I think as an industry, if we want to be long-term successful, if we want to like truly build a global financial system for the internet, we have to learn to be less greedy. We have to think more long-term and we have to be a lot more rigorous about calling out people and companies in our space that are not, you know, sort of adhering to that vision and very clearly separating them. 
Uh, we have a lot of self-inflicted wounds, obviously, and SBF is the biggest one. 2022, obviously, we saw the major contagion with countless collapses uh, of platforms that you're sort of alluding to. But there's also the non-self-inflicted wounds and the just outright false narratives that perpetuate around the asset class, right? We still see certain politicians talking about how we're going to boil the ocean or we're primarily being used to fund terrorism. So yes, I think that we have a, ne a problem of negativity of our own doing, but there's also for some reason a sort of very negative stigma coming from very loud voices. Uh, why do you think that still is at this point? I think in some ways it does come back to greed. Like more, like there was a lot of discussion in crypto circles about like how things might not be right at this player or that player last time around. But, you know, people were in a lot of deals with them. Like they wanted access to the deal. They wanted access to the party. You know, humans, we want to be cool, right? And, and calling out bad behavior, no matter what sector or thing you're in, is like basically the definition of not cool. Like nobody likes the short sellers on Wall Street. Um, except for journalists, <laughs> maybe podcast hosts, but it's hard to not be cool. Right. And, you know, I think there's something even I needed to reflect on, like I should have done a better job about expressing my concerns, you know, about some of the counterparties in the space. We were very fortunate that we were able to navigate, you know, things like the FTX explosion with minimal damage, but as an industry, we really do have to step up. I think that is people like me, CEOs of, you know, major companies in the space. I think that's people like you, you know, with a, a very, a big following on your podcast. I think we all need to, need to be more rigorous in sort of how, who we let can carry the banners in our industry. How did you survive all of that contagion? You guys seem to have come out uh, completely unscathed. Not many did. I, I could be wrong. Do you still offer an earned product? Uh, we do. Uh, we right. have an earned product. It's not right. available in the United States. Um, of course. Well, we're not very, allowed to do anything few, here. Very few fun crypto products are available in the United States. You know, we are much more conservative than most. It's easy to say. It's harder to put into practice. But, you know, to give you an example, you know, we have a seven-person board. We have three independents on it. The guy who is the chairman of our audit and risk committee was the controller of the currency, which is the federal banking regulator. Our lead director is the lead director of Walmart, the largest company in the world by sales. You know, we tend to be very principled, very conservative, and build up a lot of the apparatus around that that forces us to be. Most of the bad risk decisions that others made, I couldn't have made because someone above me would have canceled them. But that involves me sort of voluntarily handing over power, right? Which sometimes is, it may be less fun for me, but it's really necessary for the health of the company and the health of our customers. We also have the, you know, collective trauma <laughs> and wisdom of having been through so many market cycles. You know, I tell people that like being a crypto CEO is a great growth opportunity because two out of every four years, no one cares about you. One year, you're an absolute genius. And one year, you're an absolute moron. You know, and, and that's unusual, right? Like in a normal tech company, it's kind of like a little more consistent every four years. Uh, and so, you know, you get practice, you get some practice. Well, you're talking about the four year cycle, of course, which surrounds the having that we all love to talk about. We have a having coming up right now. So do you get to look like a genius in the next six to nine months? I don't know if it's the next nine months. I think it might be a little further out. I think 2025 might be the might be the genius year, but who knows? You know, I, I try not to get too attached to, too attached to it in either direction. Well, yeah, I'm not saying you're counting on price to go up so that you can look smart. It was just sort of my cute way of saying, do you think that the four year cycle is going to continue on because everybody knows the having is, you know, in April ish. And usually yeah, that means, funny, you know, my, I think this is my fourth having and every having we have this discussion is the price baked in and we like yeah i remember last one we were like it must be baked in everybody knows this now. Ha has to be we all know yeah has to be yeah when it wasn't baked in i do expect that you know the crypto market cap will be four or five times higher five years from now than it is today 
when does that happen? You know, I, you know, I don't know. I think generally speaking, like, you know, buying crypto in the year before the happening is a usually a great idea. So long as you can hold on to it for a year or two afterwards, when you've been doing one of the side effects of doing crypto as long as I have is like, you have conversations again and again, to the point that sometimes when I search my emails, I find myself like, I almost have a relevant email that I could just copy, you know, like there's probably a podcast for me before the last happening, having We're conversation. the same conversation. I'm glad that yeah. I'm so original. It makes, doesn't feel great, but Hey, what are you going to do? No, but you know, what's funny is that, you know, even here in paternally a blockchain, we're like having this conversation, like it must be, it must be priced in. Is it, is it not? Eh, let's find out. This time we'll have the ETF narrative overlying it though, or, you know, overlaying it. We'll be able to say, well, we have this much AUM coming into these and that's really what's happening. So it wasn't the having, which means we get to have this conversation again in four years, which is good. We get to you know repeat it uh, and, and I'll invite you back in four years and we'll talk about the same thing. But you did mention can't offer anything fun to Americans. I made that joke and you agreed. Are Americans ever going to get full access to this asset class in your opinion? Ever is a very long time. CFDs are a very popular product overseas. Um, contract for difference. Yeah. U.S. investors still don't have access to them. But Robinhood was able to roll out options, which is wild to me. Like CFDs are not allowed, but options are. Okay. CFDs are basically much easier to understand options. Yeah. But, you know, got there eventually. I think it just takes time. Will, they, will U.S. investors ever have access to like a 50x perpetual? Probably not, but I think that's probably an okay thing. I think they want to just know that they'll even be able to trade all the coins, right? Like for, forget even how much leverage we'll be able to use on them, which by the way, would be a nice thing for them to add in a safe, in a safe manner. But we don't even know what coins were in theory allowed to trade yet, right? And I think that uh, a lot of people still just want that regular regulatory clarity. I would have to imagine as a CEO of a platform operating in the United States, that's a pretty big topic on your mind. Yeah, I would love some regulatory clarity in the US. I think it it has gotten better over the last 10 years. Um, this is like a chat we were having with the legal and policy team. There is more clarity now than there has been historically. It's still not great. You know, most of our business is actually in Europe. The clarity in Europe and in Asia, where we also operate, is very high. Like we know exactly what we're dealing with. It's still pretty unclear where it's going to be in two or three years in the U.S. And I think, unfortunately, not a lot happens in election years. So we're probably looking at 2025, 2026 for regulatory clarity. Do you think it will materially affect the next few years of the industry, which party is elected or which candidate is elected? Yes, it does. It, it probably matters a lot, not just like which president is elected, but the composition of the Senate. You know, the interesting thing about crypto is it, neither party has really adopted a pro-crypto stance or an anti-crypto stance. You have like pro-crypto people in the Democrat party, pro-crypto people in the Republican party, you have anti-people in both. It's really not become like a, a partisan issue in the sense of like neither party is really carrying the flag for crypto, which is really interesting. Yeah, I think you have members of both party that are carrying the flag for crypto uh, and maybe just a vocal minority in one party that's raising an anti-crypto army, let's say, in theory. Although when you do polling, most Americans are actually quite supportive of crypto. So from a polling perspective, there's not like an anti-demographic on crypto. I agree, which makes you wonder why any politician would do something that's likely going to be politically unpopular. I have my theories. I don't often tin hat them uh, in, in public, but it, it genuinely makes me wonder why a progressive person would think that an asset class that helps poor people would be bad at the most basic level. No, it is a mystery. I'm not going to get you to talk about politicians, am I? No, <laughs> I don't expect you to. I don't do it either. Honestly, it just it, you kind of brought up the fact that it's an election year. Nothing gets done. We're going to be last in the United States, I think, to offer any clarity around this asset class. You mentioned that Europe obviously is uh, ahead of us. Interestingly, I remember the first iterations or conversations around Mika was 
terror, horror, worst thing ever. But then as the United States got worse and worse and worse, it seems like the vibe was, well, just give us some clarity. We don't even care if it's bad. And now people seem to think Mika is pretty great or at least totally, uh, totally, you know, acceptable. Well, the, the regulatory process outside the United States is a lot less political. It's very loaded here. You know, we've got people having Twitter wars about it, you know, CEOs of companies with regulators. And it's like a, it's a high drama situation. Most other countries, it's not. It's more of an administrative process. When, you know, Samika Zim worked on for many, many years. We've been active on it for many, many years. And it has changed significantly over those years. Is it everything that we would have wanted? No. Is it a reasonable, workable solution that will keep investors and customers safe and allow innovation to flourish? Yes. Getting there was a long process. And there was a, you know quite a few companies that really put in the work to make that happen. So I think, you know, not only has like the U.S. gotten worse, you're right there, but also, you know, the Mika proposal got better. And I think like the duality of that's important to recognize. It got better and it's still not even as good as some of the more favorable jurisdictions where it seems that everybody is moving or at least building, obviously, United Arab Emirates, Singapore, people even talking about Hong Kong, right? I thought that China bans were our biggest uh, problem. Now we're talking about adoption in Hong Kong. How do you go about cherry picking jurisdictions and expanding your business around the world when the regulatory environment is different everywhere? We look at the size of a market, right? There might be really friendly regulations in, I'm going to make up a city, Peterlandia. But if there's only eight residents in Peterlandia, that's not a very interesting market, right? So first of all, we're always looking at like, how many customers can we serve? What's the market opportunity? And then secondly, you know, what's the amount of clarity that we have? I'm really blessed that, you know, general counsels in crypto are often in a very unstable position. You know, the guy that leads our legal team has been with the firm for over four or five years now. The guy that leads policy has been with me for seven years. So I lean on them really, really closely. Um, and they've been able to to really do quite well on the strategy side of licensing and regulatory. It is a huge part of your job as a crypto CEO and as a crypto company, thinking through regulation, making sure that it's workable. You know, it's um, it's definitely something that I wouldn't have predicted how much time and effort and how big a part of my life it would be, you know, a decade ago when we were all starting out. I mean, what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Is it meetings with politicians, meeting with regulators? Is it just your life is owned by lawyers? Uh, how does that actually play out when you're trying to run a business? I've got, I've got to imagine you've got like more, more lawyers than employees at this point. No, no, I definitely have more employees than lawyers. Um, That's good. You're winning. But you know, it's close. No, I'm kidding. Um, I would say that probably 10 to 15% of my time is spent on it um, in a good week. And there are some weeks where that's more like 80, 90. I mean, that seems like a monster waste of time. You know, sometimes it can feel that way, but it's it's really important long-term work. You know, it's not, and this is kind of what it comes back to, I was talking about being oriented for the really long-term versus the short-term. That work is super important in the long-term. You know, it's not as important in the short-term. But yeah, I'm here for another 10 years. Yeah, maybe longer, come on, man. Maybe long. Yeah, you, you, can't, you can't give us an expiration date. Uh, you know, this is a, it's, we're going to be here doing this forever. We're going to have a conversation in 40 years. So obviously we've got, it could happen, man. There's only two of us that have been CEOs of crypto companies for this long now. You and? Brian Armstrong. Armstrong. Was he 2011? We both have over 10 years. I mean, that's wild. And I think the next longest is maybe at eight, seven or eight years. You're like a unicorn. I mean, it's really crazy when you think of how many there have been and how much turnover there's been at a, a number of exchanges. It's really a testament, I mean, to what you've built. So I think we all know what you've built. Now, let's say we go into this Goldilocks zone where you can kind of do whatever you want and we get regulatory clarity and all these wonderful things. What do you want to build blockchain.com into, into a perfect world? I know there will be restrictions in the real world, but like ideally you've got this full exchange, you've got an earn program, you've got the wallet, you've got the blockchain explorer, you have a you know prime brokerage, institutional side. What else is there to build? We serve 2,000 institutional clients around the world. 
we got started in this for a really simple goal. <laughs> Still the goal. We wanted to help people be in the crypto financial system. Like we wanted to be a company that when you wanted to do something in crypto or, you know, later on a fund or a foundation or an institutional client that we could provide a high level of service to enable you to do that. So we, we really view ourselves as very customer driven, very customer demand driven. We view ourselves as enablers, not in a bad way. Um, but as enablers, like we empower you to be part of the crypto ecosystem. And so, you know, a lot of times people ask me like, what do you want the company to stand for another five, 10 years? I'm super proud of the fact that we've like never broken a trade on a customer. We've never not honored a withdrawal. We've never put up the gates. Our site has triple nine reliability, which is very hard to you know, do in crypto. Like we are a reliable, safe partner to people and institutions that want to be part of the crypto financial system. And, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, 50 years from now, I want that to be our reputation. The products that we deliver are going to change. The services that matter to people are going to change. The customer demand is going to change. But that reputation and that delivery is the thing that we're going to stick to over the next 5, 10, and 50 years. Pretty crazy. You mentioned you and Brian Armstrong, and I just remember, I, I didn't get in until 2016, but the meme of the first four to five years, maybe still currently, of my crypto journey was, I can go on Coinbase, and if the exchange is down, I know that something volatile happened with Bitcoin. I don't need to look at a chart. I just know that if Coinbase goes down, that something's going on, right? And yeah. so not having those outages when the biggest exchanges of the world, some of our biggest blockchains uh, do is is pretty, pretty crazy. How... I got to ask you, so you mentioned you do still have a yield product. Us Americans can't use it. How do you safely offer yield in crypto in 2024 after everything that we saw, you know, over the last few years? Uh, yeah. So, you know, we mentioned we run a prime brokerage. Um, that's where people are going long and short. Um, we still provide that to institutions. We do it on an over collateralized basis. Um, there were times in the past when we provided under collateralized or structured products. We no longer do that. Um, and so we run very sort of very conservative, you know, the yields are lower. We also do staking, right? So some people would rather be in a liquid earned product than a staking product. So, you know, a lot of the earned assets are staked and that's basically how we do it. And then on some things, you know, some things we don't even earn anything on the assets. We just pay it as a customer acquisition tool. Yeah, that makes sense. You said that you have 2000 institutional clients, which seems like an exceptionally high number when we talk about there being no institutional adoption yet. But I'm assuming these are pretty much crypto focused funds and companies and not the mainstream. Is that a correct assumption? It is. We also do have mainstream like TradFi clients, um, but they do represent a, min a minority of our business. The majority of our business is other crypto companies, funds, high net worths, you know, that we're very privileged to provide services to. Talking about that, and you talked about how we have institutional products, but not really institutional adoption. When I brought up the ETF, what do you think is going to trigger them? Or I should say, what do you think is going to get them to finally pull the trigger and view Bitcoin first? Uh, let's not even talk about the rest of it, but to really view this as a treasury asset, as a, you know, as a, a benefit to the sharp ratio of your portfolio, all the things that we know are true. We have the ETF now, right? So the, the rails are there, the plumbing is there. Now we just need them to care. Well, we don't need them to care, first of all. Like okay. Bitcoin That's and crypto fair. have done just fine without them. That's true. Um, fair. I fair. think what will cause them to care is performance. Like humans are mostly motivated by like greer, greed or avoidance of pain. As asset managers start putting Bitcoin into portfolios and it's successful in driving portfolio performance, that's greed, right? Other people are then going to allocate because of fear. Fear that they're going to underperform the people that have Bitcoin in their portfolio. Bummer. That's how it works. Like it works that way with retail. It works that way with institutions. Humans are almost always in markets doing things out of greed or out of fear. And, you know, usually the late, you know, the best and most bold investors exclusively do things out of greed. But in greed doesn't have to be bad. Greed is like conviction and the potential of an investment. I'm going to do this even though it makes me feel uncomfortable. Like, you know, buying Bitcoin at 18K was probably uncomfortable for the people that did it a year ago. 
It was for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I remember buying some Bitcoin around 21 and I was like, I think this is the bottom. And then I bought it and then immediately the market's like, Whoa. I was like, well, nope. But I have to imagine you've got a pretty low cost basis considering your uh, starting timeline. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's come a long way since I started buying Bitcoin. But I've I've bought Bitcoins at all kinds of prices. Like I bought Bitcoin at sub $100 and I've bought Bitcoin at 40K. What keeps you buying, right? I mean, most people would say, hey, man, you accumulated a bunch of Bitcoin under $100. Listen, I'm not implying you never sold any. I have no idea. Maybe maybe you did. Most people I know who were in 2010 were like, $1,000 Bitcoin, I'm out of here, right? And sold everything. So uh, I'm not going to presume that that's not the case. But what keeps you buying Bitcoin? I mean, it's like consistently one of the best things in my portfolio. Like you tend to add to things that go really well, right? And also I think it becomes a compulsion, like just buying Bitcoin. There's the real like, answer. And I finally got the real answer. The first one, the first yeah. one was the uh, canned answer. The second one is yeah. we're religion and, you know. <laughs> yeah, we're religion and like, you know, I got to buy it in the, in, the, in, the, in the bottom year, you know, I got to buy some more coins. You got to. Do you think that there will be a point where you don't view this as something you need to continue to add to? I mean, we see like the sailors of the world, right? He, I, the guy's never stopping, right? And I think all of us have a little in my, in us. In my book, that guy's like, he's still, you know, from my perspective, that guy's still like a, he like just joined the party. Yeah, he's a noob. Totally. He's a noob. He says that actually, you know, like I think one of my last interviews with him, he called himself a freshman in Bitcoin. He, he actually openly acknowledges that. Yeah, I think he's about to go to sophomore status. Yeah, pretty good. I'm like, I'm at least a junior now. If you're a junior, who's a senior? <laughs> <laughs> There's people that predate me. Um, you know, a handful. I will probably always be buying more crypto. It is really hard to imagine stopping. I think I would only stop buying crypto if I didn't believe in the vision anymore. Well, you said, obviously, that... Um... It's more complex. There's so much more. You understand it less than you did at the beginning. Now, does that mean that you uh, dabble beyond Bitcoin? Oh yeah, I'm. You know, I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist at all. I, I um, can't even see your laser eyes through the camera, so I guess you're not. I've never, I've never posted a laser eyes photo. And one of these people is less passionate about Bitcoin and more passionate about human economic freedom, as I kind of mentioned. So like. Obviously, like because I hold different crypto assets, some of them becoming the de facto standard would be better than others in my book. But I don't really care. Like if you're like if if somebody's like, hey, you ended up having a very middle class life, which you know I was is going to happen either way. But crypto becomes ubiquitous. Human economic freedom, you know, flourish flourishes as a result. But none of the stuff you own becomes all that valuable. Is that okay for you? That would be okay. For me. Yeah. You know, maybe I'd start a podcast. That'd be my monetization scheme. It's really a non-for-profit, I have to tell you, but it's a bad plan. Continue. Yeah, we we, we run a loss-making podcast at blockchain.com if you'd ever like to do it's the amazing reverse business. interview. Amazing. I, I actually, I, I think I'm perfect for that job, but yeah, okay, continue. Yeah, we can, uh, yeah, we can, we can interview you on the blockchain.com pass about your podcast. It would be very, that'd be very, very actually good. entertaining. But yeah. Look, so I'm way more on the human economic freedom side. I hope Bitcoin works out because it has a huge market advantage. It's super secure network, very hard money. A lot of things I love about Bitcoin. A lot of things that I think are a challenge, you know, future problems, things that are gonna have to be dealt with. And that's why I think it's important to, to have more than Bitcoin out there in the world. I think that Bitcoin is, I think competition makes things better. It's actually, you know, as someone who most of my business is Bitcoin related revenue, I know, probably 60%. I think it's really important that there are other crypto protocols out there for competition. Like, and it's one of the things that drives me like nuts about the Bitcoin maxi movement, which seems to be dying off now, is like, don't tell them that. We yeah. want all these other coins to exist because they're going to make whatever comes out the other side stronger. I mean, I literally say something to that effect all the time. Like, if it's such a big threat to Bitcoin, then maybe Bitcoin isn't as great as you think it is. I think Bitcoin is as great exactly. as you think it is, by the way. But like, why is the existence of something that's effectively completely different such a threat to Bitcoin? It's not. Yeah, it drives me nuts. People are like, Bitcoin is amazing. It's going to change the world. It's the best coin ever. Also, no one should compete with it. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> But we're all here because free markets. 
Oh, I, when they start cheering for the regulators and to get, you know, to crack down on other things, that's the one that always gets me. Really libertarian and permissionless, uh, unless it's a thing I don't like. Please do regulation to make my bag go up. I'm like, what? I'm, I spend a lot of time in the EVM space. So Ethereum and all its many wonderful derivations. I'm also, you know, I wasn't um, a big Solana. I wasn't spending a lot of time on Solana four years ago. But I've spent a lot of time in the Solana ecosystem over the last year. I love a, crypt, a crypto project after it's come back from like the brink. Yeah. And Solana definitely came back from the brink uh, in a big way. And the user experience it delivers is really interesting to me. Can also say all kinds of things I'm concerned about with Solana, but like it's definitely worth spending time on. Um, I'm sure you do as well. And, you know, the team there responded in a fantastic way. So yeah, I'm I'm interested in lots of coins that are not Bitcoin. It's the uh, Game of Thrones, what is dead may never die mentality. Yeah. You know, I, I agree with you actually. I think that they showed incredible grit and uh you know, incredible dedication and that their community didn't really abandon them. I think the narrative abandoned Solana because people just thought they were inextricably tied to Sam and to FTX. But what they've managed to build through all of that, it's really remarkable. And I, I like you, I also think there's downsides. I'm not even like a huge Sol Solana homer, but you have to step back and give them credit where it's due. Yeah. And I mean, look, like they responded to that situation, A plus to them and deserves a lot of respect. I think, you know, where it goes next is interesting. We're all going to watch. Um, you know, a lot of my friends are major Solana bulls. Let's see. But they're really delivering a lot of value to users. And I, I have a lot of a lot of respect for that. And seeing seeing the growth of that and the growth of products, like you know, like uh the on-chain trading products on Solana are the best on-chain trading products in the industry. Yeah, I I think that once you actually start using it, uh it's hard to dislike it after you've used things in other ecosystems. It really is just incredibly fast and smooth and they're starting to solve those UX UI problems. Now listen, that's your approach as Peter, the enthusiast, but at Peter is the CEO, you can't list all this stuff, right? You have 73 pairs uh, total on blockchain.com when I opened it up. How do you decide what you can and can't list? I don't. How um, does somebody at blockchain.com who works for you decide what you can and cannot list? There's a token approval process, which goes up to a approval committee, which is sort of compliance, legal business product and tokens go through that process. Yeah. And is that basically like your own version of what's likely to be deemed a security at some point? Well, uh, no, cause we mostly list stuff outside the U S but yeah, we're looking at a variety of factors and we collaborate really closely with under other industry participants as well. That makes sense. So you got anything big coming this year? I asked you about the five, 10 year vision, but is there anything, you know, before we're done here that uh, you guys have that you're really excited about or that you're building or integrating? Yeah. So we launched a couple of things recently that I'm, I'm pretty excited about. One is called um, blockchain.com pay. That is basically an on-ramp for other DeFi wallets. So our history is in the DeFi wallet side. We built this brokerage platform that, you know, today is like one of the top brokerage platforms in the market. It was really built to be part of and partnered with a DeFi wallet experience, which makes it pretty different from a lot of brokerage platforms. We got in requests for a couple of years to extend that to other players. We launched that product Q4. We've got a bunch of big partnerships coming out over the next two quarters on that front. And I'm really excited to do that because we're going to help other DeFi wallets onboard people into crypto. Um, and so very aligned to our mission of increasing access and you know, letting people just choose the best product that they want. So I'm really, really excited for that. And then, um, you know, the other thing that I think is going to be really great this year is we're opening up local operations in Nigeria. Wow. Which is one of the top three crypto markets in the world and very complicated <laughs> to, to service customers there. We have a lot of them there, millions and millions. And figuring out how to operate there in a compliant, safe manner, it's been very challenging, but we're getting very close to a local rollout in Nigeria. And I'm really excited about that. What are the biggest challenges there, just uh, top end? Is it just completely like dealing with the government and regulator and things like that? Or is it the actual people's access to 
internet or banking and all the magic problems we would sort of imagine in Africa. Yeah, you need to do compliance differently. You need to do identity verification differently. You need, you know, there's a license that you need to get. Like it's top to bottom, just a completely different world in Nigeria. And why are you so committed to getting that done with all of those roadblocks? I can't believe it's, I mean, I, I know that they have massive crypto adoption there, but I know that the, you know, the actual numbers and volume itself is, is not huge. Is that just about the ethos of expanding this to everywhere that you can in the world where people actually want it? Well, actually, the numbers are huge. That's one of the right. misunderstood things. Yeah, I was under the impression it wasn't. Yeah. But more importantly, like millions of customers there. Yeah. And I want to serve our customers well. So <laughs> we're going to yeah, figure I, it out. The stories I've heard about Nigeria... Uh, Ray Youssef, who used to be at Paxful and others. I mean, um, seems like that's one of the few places in the world where people are using this as a full complementary financial system and nobody's talking about it. And the usage does not go up and down with the Bitcoin market. It is not correlated to the price of Bitcoin. Every other market we're in, highly correlated to the price of Bitcoin, whether dollar or their local currency, it's not correlated in Nigeria. So like, if there's any users that we should be supporting, it's those ones. Yeah, yeah. I've had a few people who just continue to say that we're all looking in the wrong markets. We're all focused on the regulators in the wrong places. It's all misdirection and that this is all going to build in Africa and South America. And it sounds like that's legitimately the case. I don't think it's all going to happen there, but I think they're way more important than people realize. Yeah, I love that. So can we uh, have another conversation when you guys launch in Nigeria and talk about how that went and what the challenges were? I think that'd be really compelling. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's probably like probably by mid year. I'll know enough to tell you. That sounds awesome. We're going to definitely do that. And where can people follow you after uh, the conversation and check out everything at blockchain.com? Yeah. So the website is just blockchain.com. Super easy. I gave it away. I gave um, it away. Yeah. My, my Twitter is one more Peter, all words. Um, you can find me there and you can also find blockchain at Twitter at app blockchain. Um, much more active Twitter feed than mine. Um, yeah. But yeah, I uh, and I love hearing from customers. So, you know, drop me a note on on Twitter or wherever else. And I'm always happy to interact there. Well, listen, man, I appreciate you taking the time. It was an awesome conversation. People know we sat down in Singapore and we had like seven minutes. It was in person, <laughs> but it was very, very quick. And so I guess at this point in 2024, when you meet the CEO who's been around this long, you say congratulations on existing. So <laughs> to, to end, I say congratulations on existing. It's a great feat. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And thanks for having me on the podcast. I'll look forward to talking to you in the summer. Awesome. Thanks, Peter.